let's begin okay so today's topic is uh, analyzing the games of world champion willem steinitz he was the first uh, undisputed world champion and okay uh, so today we're going to have a look at a few of his games so i chose uh, some of his best games so okay let's let's dive right in guys okay so this is the first game uh, of the day so okay so here we have an e4 e5 knight f3 knight to c6 and after we get into the italian we see that uh, we have an evans gambit on the board okay so with b4 this move signifies the evans gambit and this is was this was a very famous gambit in the time a very aggressive move uh, which you guys can also try in your own games it's actually pretty interesting okay so black okay this is one such gambit where okay declining the gambit does not make sense uh, the best way to take accept the gambit is just to take with the bishop taking with the knight of course hangs the e5 pawn we don't want to do that uh, that actually helps white so okay taking with bishop and c3 so what white aims to do with this pawn sacrifice is he wants to get c3 d4 in quick time so after bishop c5 he castles first and uh, after d3 he gets d4 so he gained a couple of tempi on this bishop so this is uh, the point of the pawn sacrifice and also he makes the b2 square not blocked so basically this bishop has a very good role of coming to a3 in many variations okay as you might even see in this game okay so pawn captures pawn captures and bishop d6 so if you watched a video on the first uh, world champion of paul morphy we would see a similar game where we saw the move knight c3 and uh, the game went on with knight f6 and paul morphy exploited this bad move with e5 here what uh, Steinitz wants to do this is something similar but he doesn't want to waste time with knight c3 he wants to play e5 but the problem here is when you play e5 black doesn't have to open the position and he can respond with d5 okay so what he does is he plays d5 now at first glance this might look like an anti positional move like the blocking your own bishop like what what is he doing so what but what is actual plan is is actually to make the break e5 very very powerful so he wants to stop the pawn push d5 and he wants to make the break e5 effective so in effect you're actually not bro blocking the bishop permanently because at some point uh, this bishop this uh, pawn is going to try to get traded off and this diagonal will still again come back to life okay so okay d5 was on the board and we have knight a5 trying to trade off the bishop okay so there is no real threat on the bishop uh, because okay here uh, he plays e5 hanging the bishop if you take the bishop uh, black in i mean white can win back the piece this way uh, but in the game black missed his opportunity to pick, to pick up uh, white's very strong bishop and he continued with the move bishop d7 now threatening to take the bishop and uh, queen a4 check is not available so okay uh, black goes bishop d uh, white goes bishop d3 uh, uh, saving his bishop black continues with knight e7 trying to develop more pieces it finished development of uh, all his pieces and he is now trying to get his king to safety before the e file opens up and black castles and right here okay castling is not the best option the problem with castling here is uh, you don't have a knight on f6 and many times when you don't have a knight on f6 the h7 point becomes extremely weak and like in this game this and also g4 h5 squares are accessible by the queen in with a knight on uh, f6 we might have good control of these squares but now we don't have defense of h7 or control of these key squares so okay uh, here black castles and white in, in immediately starts with bishop g5 he brings a piece and pins the knight to the queen black plays queen e8 unpinning and we have knight e4 and this is actually a very nice move bringing all the pieces towards the king side now all of white's four minor pieces are just charging towards the king side and over here black makes a critical mistake he plays knight g6 and white is already completely winning the move is knight f6 it was played in the game and this move is a piece sacrifice and the point uh, of this move and this is actually a, the best move in the position okay so the point of this uh, piece sacrifice is to completely open the position up he has to take because there's a fork and after takes a bishop into f6 
and already white is having all kinds of uh, mating ideas with these weak dark squares being exploited the dark square bishop is on the other side of the board and cannot assist with these weak squares okay uh, black plays d takes e5 which is already again another mistake and it, as of this moment uh, simply queen d2 followed by queen h6 is unstoppable checkmate uh, except for the one uh, move that black found knight f4 over here there is an interesting move knight e5 which uh, is ending uh, by you know mate by force or black has to give up his queen but in the game white found a uh, another way to win this game he found a very flashy queen sacrifice queen takes f4 okay of course knight e5 was winning uh, on the spot checkmating faster than queen f4 uh, but okay queen f4 was played in the game this is a queen sacrifice and the point is after e takes f4 knight g5 and the problem here is bishop in h7 is checkmate and there is no real way for you to avoid this without giving up your queen you have to play queen e4 and white based his idea on this move so he sacked a piece on f6 but he got it back so his idea of giving up the queen was getting back the piece and really having a better position with uh, about level material so okay uh, over here you have to play queen e4 because you cannot move this rook without moving this rook the king cannot get escape squares so queen e4 was played in the game bishop takes on e4 and rook e8 now as of this position okay bishop into h7 was played in the game king f8 and if you look at this position one would think okay the queens are off the board the attack might have ended and the dust might have settled but white had different ideas white played bishop d3 now black is uh, okay trying to consolidate here so he wants he he feels that the attack is over he wants to bring his pieces to better squares uh, but the bishop d3 move actually is very annoying for black he cannot improve his knight he cannot improve his bishop the way he wants to uh, so he plays the move a6 trying to say okay i want to play bishop b5 in this position but this position actually a6 is is probably uh, one of the best moves but it's already losing the exchange by force the problem here is uh, starting this tactic with knight h7 check okay so king g8 is forced and again a very nice bishop retreat bishop c3 the point here is to vacate the f6 square for this knight so knight is coming in and making a fork and it's not very easy to get rid of this threat the problem is this is actually not only trying to win the exchange but it's also hitting the bishop the best move at this point was actually to play bishop b5 and give up the exchange uh, but okay like in bad positions it's a tendency for i mean all players to try to hold on to everything so okay he tries to hold on instead of just giving up material and accepting his position was bad and rook e7 was one way to do it uh, another way was just to play rook d8 but both ways you are actually losing the exchange by force that okay so here knight f6 check was played in the game and you can't really go here or to these squares because your piece will be uh, taken for free uh, because of the discovered check so he had to play king f8 and already uh, after bishop b4 black resigned the game because it's very difficult to deal with this threat it's just uh, looking like an exchange up advantage but actually white will not hurry in taking the rook white will try to play rook e1 and try to put pressure on this rook it's not clear how black is defending although with accurate defense black will only lose the exchange there are so many uh, you know scope of making mistakes for example at this position this bishop is actually hanging the best move here is actually rook d8 is very difficult to find you would like to play moves like rook e8 try to defend the rook but it's not easy it's not easy you have c5 resource after ampersan you might have knight in knight into c6 but then again you hang the bishop on d7 so and also with c5 this bishop will hang on b6 so in many of these variations uh, you know white is winning more than an exchange so it was very difficult position and black had had enough black resigned in this position and with that we come to the end of our first game guys so in this game we saw a very flashy queen sacrifice followed by a very sweet uh, finishing tactic that helped white to win the game quickly let's move on to the second game guys okay in the second game uh, we have uh, 
Johannes Zuckertot playing against Willem Steinitz. Okay, Willem Steinitz playing with the black pieces in this game. And okay, the game starts with d4. d4 in this opening. Johannes Zuckertot chooses the Queen's Gambit. This is, again, one of the first introductions of Queen's Gambit here. Okay, he plays Queen's Gambit declined. And knight c3. Knight f6. And these positions have been played uh, up till today. Like, this, this is popular stuff even today. Okay. Bishop g5. Bishop e7. And uh, knight f3. But in this position, today it's well known that uh, e3 is a main move. And e3 is actually very logical if you think about it, developing this bishop. But white chooses uh, after castles to go for c5. Which is actually trying to say that, okay, my pawn is on the fifth rank now and is commanding some space on the queen side, which is actually good for white. But in this position, it happens to be already equalizing for black. So black is already caught up. Black finds the correct way to uh, exploit this uh, mistake with b6. And whenever white prematurely advances this pawn to c5, we can actually advance b6 and uh, try to break up white's strong pawn here. White tries to hold on with b4. And we have b takes c5, but the mistake uh, of white was to capture with the d pawn. And here, white misjudged this imbalance. He created a queenside majority fighting against the central majority, but here, white does not have ambitious chances with the queenside majority because of this pawn structure, which makes it very difficult to make a passer. Whereas in the center, black can just gain space very easily. And it's easier for him to make a passer on on d3, make breaking on d3. So we see this happening in this game. Black quickly tries to break up the pawns with a5. Uh, white plays a3. And black plays d4, pushing his central majority. Now asking this knight to leave its natural square on c3. Uh, bishop into f6 was played. We have g into f6, which is actually... A uh, very good move here. The pro the point is, it's actually helping the central majority. Uh, so, okay, bishop in f6, knight e4, the bishop would have had to go, go back, which is also playable in this position. And black would be completely fine still having the advantage in this position. But uh, g to f6 is also fine. Uh, even though it exposes the king, it's actually playable here. Knight a4 was played because it was hanging. And just e5, trying to advance his majority more and more. We see b5 and okay, that was the point of knight a4, protecting the c5 pawn so that a b5 was possible. Okay, so we have bishop e6 and already, okay, now black is starting to get his pieces into play and bishop e6 uh, is a very, very interesting move here. As we see in the game, okay, g3 was played since uh, he cannot play d3 here. Uh, he tries to bring the bishop out in the fianchetto. We have c6 trying to break up white queen side uh, pawns uh, but actually this uh, this move by white here is a mistake so white should have tried to play b6 and hold on to his protected passer in this position and after knight d7 he has to uh, be happy with trying to protect this pawn multiple times with rook c1 and uh, trying to cast it and put a knight on d3 and protect this pawn as much as possible but here white just wanted to take and not allow pressure on c5 which was a mistake. Although the c5 pawn is a passer, it's a blockaded passer and it's not of any value as until and unless you move this knight. Okay, so okay, we have bishop g2 in the game, already looking at the knight and kind of looking at the rook. So he quickly plays rook b8, putting the rook on the b file, not only getting out of the pin, but also making an immediate threat of bishop b3, which wins the piece. Okay. So we have queen c1 getting out of this threat and already d3 is a devastating blow. The point is uh, white hasn't castled yet and white is not ready to take on d3. White had to play e3 here. If white took on d3, queen takes d3 and already this position is completely lost. With resources of uh, bishop to c4 and rook b3 kind of resources coming in. Uh, this position is very very difficult to play as white. Okay, white did not take, white knows this, and white tries to keep the position as close as possible. As we saw in the previous uh, examples of uh, the last stream, when uh, we keep the position close, I mean, we try to open the position, the side with the better developed pieces will usually have an advantage. And right here, kings is not, this his king is not castled. So that is really, really bad. If his king is stuck in the center, 
these pieces will prove to be very active for that king. So, okay, we have e4, uh, securing this pawn on d3, making it a protected passer. We have knight d2, and finally, he manages to blockade the passer, but it's not enough here. We have f5 uh, protecting this pawn because it was under pressure. And white finally manages the time to castle. But as of this point, black has already gathered enough advantage. He played rook e8, a very, very positional move. A very deep positional move that uh, just improves the position, asking white what he wants to do. So this idea was not, uh, you know, very prevalent back then. Back then, it was all about attacking and sacrificing. But even then, trying, uh, you know, seeing these kind of moves uh, is very, very, uh, you know, uh, very, very nice. So okay, uh, here we have f3 trying to break up these pawns, but already uh, he starts off with his tactics. He sacrifices a piece on knight d4, but this is not actually a sacrifice. The point is, uh, after you take. You get back the knight and you win a pawn. But in the game, you will see that uh, he will not directly jump to take the knight. You have to take this knight because if this knight jumps to e2, it's going to be a little dangerous. You're going to get forked. So uh, you could try king h1, which is a possible move. Uh, but okay, in that line, we have, uh, we can go king h1. We have ef3, bishop f3, knight f3, knight f3. And uh, anyway, the king is not safe after the continuation of bishop d5. And okay, here already uh, white is not comfortable at the very least. Black can get enough counterplay to put white at a bad spot. Okay, so okay. So white didn't choose this. White chose to take the knight. And after queen d4 check, he played king h1. Now if black takes this, uh, white will be more than happy to take on e4 and uh, claim that okay, he has enough pressure on d3 and he doesn't have too much play. But instead, black forgets about the piece and just pushes the pawn, which is act, which is the best move in the position, e3. And uh, this knight now is you know, also hanging, so also this knight. Okay, white saves this knight, saying, okay, if you want the pawn, you know, if you want to take the piece back, you have to break up your strong pawn to the third rank. Uh, black was not interested. Black played a bishop f6, saying, okay, I want to take this knight. I want to keep my pawns this way so that I can continue pushing them with ease. Okay, now white saying, okay, if you don't take that, now you can't take my piece. Uh, but black was more than happy with this move. And over here, black found a winning combination, which started with d2. Queen c2 and bishop b3, hanging the f5 pawn. But really, it's not of any danger. You can take on f5, but you don't even have a good check here. So, okay, uh, we have queens on d1. Knight takes d1 and bishop takes d1. Knight c3, putting pressure on the d1 bishop. And here, black plays d2. And after the move, rook a to d1. Uh, black simply finishes off the game very elegantly with the move queen c3, uh, claiming that, okay, white has kind of self forked himself with this move rook ad1 and he just he will drop a rook and with that while black will be a full rook up and it will be a very easy conversion and white simply resigned in this point so this position uh, i mean this game showed us a very good example of how the central majority can be superior to the queen side majority if you make uh, the decision too early in the game so in uh, middle games where you know, peace activity is sufficient for both sides, but white hadn't castled yet. The central majority was very, very dangerous for white to fight against. But in general, it's a very interesting topic, which we need to discuss more about. Okay, so, okay let's jump on to the third game. The third game was between William Steinitz and Augustus Mongredian. Okay, so we have E4 and D5, Scandinavian defense. Okay, it's very interesting that we also see, get to see a variety of openings uh, as the time goes on forward. Okay, queen takes d5, knight c3, and queen back to d8. So we see the queen d8 variation played in this game. We have d4, claiming a space in the center, and e6. So we see these positions even today. Uh, but over here, after knight f6, bishop d3, bishop e7, and castles. Both sides castle, and bishop goes to e3. 
b6 now that this bishop is blocked over here he says okay i'm going to bring my bishop over on b7 which is a logical idea and knight e5 after bishop b7 we have f4 cementing that knight on e5 is a very good idea here and after knight d7 we have queen e2 trying to bring the last piece into the game knight d5 was on the board and knight takes d5 but here black plays pawn takes d5 shutting down the bishop now the bishop is not so active although black will try to break up uh, the central position with this uh, move c5 and he will try to open the position after rook f3 here, uh, he tries to swing over his rook or uh, to the h file and uh, bring his queen. So this is the point uh, that white wants to make here. And after h3, white just opens the position with g4. A very, very effective pawn break. And okay, black takes this and he just sacks the rook on h7. A very, very powerful move. Uh, and the point of this move is now, okay, we're putting pressure on g6. But even though black takes on e5 first, white is not worried about this. He takes back with f pawn. And after king h7, queen g4, you're actually threatening a very dangerous attack starting with queen g6. And this position is already bad for black. Black responds with rook g8. But white continues his, his attack with queen h5 check. Because this pawn is pinned, or you cannot capture. Uh, king h7, king g7, I mean queen h6 check. King f7, queen h7 check, a very precise move. Instead of bringing the rook into the attack with tempo, which would allow an easy escape of the king, he plays queen h7, not allowing the king to go to e8 because of this rook hang. You know, so his rook is hanging. Black, however, plays king e6, and over here, white finds queen h3. And right now, after uh, king f7, the difference is rook f1 check. Even though the king can go to e8, he can't go to d7. So the tempo that he got by bringing the queen to h3 is allowing him to bring the rook even into the game. After queen e6, he's threatening a decisive move. Bishop g6. Uh, after queen, uh, I mean rook g7 here, he plays bishop g5, bringing the final piece into the attack. And now the point is, okay, you're just putting too much pressure on this. Uh, square and you're going to now you're just preparing bishop uh, g6 shot after queen d7 it the game is already instantly uh there's a forced mate so after bishop into g6 check uh rook into g6 was forced if king d8 uh, we'll see a similar pattern of what happened in the game there's a rook f8 uh, you take and rook into f8 uh, rook into e8 is mate instead uh in the game we have rook into g6 Queen into g6, but anyway, the similar pattern occurs after rook f8, queen e8, and queen into e8. It's showing a very good example of you know how to destroy the castle with a very very stunning sacrifice, rook into h7. So a rook sacrifice game, which was very interesting, and we can learn a lot from this kind of play. Okay, so we move on to the fourth game against the same opponent about a year later. Uh, let's see. So e4, g6. Now this time, instead of the Scandinavian, he chooses to play the modern defense. So that was Augustine Mongredian. He plays uh, one year later, the same uh, opponent. Okay, bishop g7, c3. Okay, so even uh, before the time of uh, Aaron Imzovich, who put a word to the hyper-modern type of thinking, we see this uh, kind of openings played, which is again very fascinating. Bishop e3, or bishop b7. And knight to d2. Okay, and on knight e7. And okay, queen e2 was played. And this was the, uh, okay, the, we've developed all our pieces after castles. And uh, here, instead of castling, he uses his hedge pawn to open the position against the black king. And Black develops all his pieces, but white just continues with h5. This is actually a very, very uh, interesting idea. The point here is that he wants to open the h file, exploiting the fact that he hasn't castled and rook is still on h1, and he's ready to castle queenside. Black plays knight f6, hanging the e5 pawn for one move. White could have taken here, uh, but okay, white chooses to open the h file, which is what he's more interested in. 
then taking the pawn on e5. Okay, knight into g6 now defends the pawn. Uh, okay, and now white castles. Now white is happy that he has an open file and he's satisfied that even though he has a pawn that's moved uh, in front of his king, making this break easier to open the c file and attack his king, his attack is actually coming much faster. c5 was played and okay, here knight g5 move uh, with an idea of you know uh, attacking h7 pawn. We have a6, uh, black tries to get his pawns moving on the queen side, uh, but black is a little slow here because white just strikes with knight h7, sacrificing the piece. Over here, black should not take the piece. Instead, black should continue with something like knight f4, trying to curb the activity of the white pieces. Instead, black chooses to just capture on h7. Over here, white strikes again with rook into h7. It can be noted that okay, here, even queen h5 is still winning for white. But okay, uh, white chose to do it this way. So rook into h7, king into h7, and queen h5 check. King forced to g8, and now he brings the rook, another rook to the h file. Very interesting uh, that he, okay, he's already threatening mate here. So this rook has to move to stop this. Rook e8 is forced, and queen takes on g6. Again, exploiting this pin, the knight was hanging. So he, he was actually making a nice double attack there. So the hanging knight and the mate. Okay, queen f6 and already, okay, you might think black is starting to defend, but actually black uh, loses his queen on the spot in this position. So you can probably uh, try to figure out the tactic here. Or you can pause the video. I will be showing you the move here. We have bishop into f7. And the point here is after queen into h7, there's a rook h8. And king into h8, the queen is hanging on f7. And it was in this position that, uh, again, Augustus Mungvidian resigned the game. In view of, okay, we have queen for two pawns against, queen and two pawns against two rooks. Uh, although, okay, uh, black pieces uh, are not connected. They're not active. They're not active and they're not harmonious. So whenever you're playing queen versus material, say if two rooks or a rook and a minor piece or you know, three minor pieces and those kind of imbalances. What you need to look for is the side without the queen needs to have a safe king. And the side with the queen need not, should not have any, you know, uh, helpers. Like here, he has two minor pieces helping the queen, which is too much, which is too much to handle with an unsafe king. You will get mated uh, most of the time. And also, you have more pawns. So black doesn't really have a way to generate play and black is actually completely lost in this position. Okay, uh, this it'll be very easy for white to organize an attack which is minor pieces and queen working together on this exposed king. And it can be noted that already he's uh, having a threat on this bishop. So black has to just start defending in this position and you cannot play against a queen if you're forced to defend. Let's uh, move on to the fifth game, guys. Okay, so here in this game, okay, William Steinitz is playing white. And again, we see another game with d4, d5. And the queen's gambit is again on the board. This time Steinitz is playing it. Okay. So again, it's a queen's gambit. Declined. Bishop g5. Bishop e7. And e3. This time uh, he doesn't uh, go for this mistake. He plays e3, which is an improvement to that previous game. Castles. Knight f3 and d6. So even today we see these setups very, very often. Bishop b7 and castle. So these positions are very common even to, to this day. Knight b to d7 and c captures on d5. And you can see out of the opening, we have a very, very interesting Carlsbad structure. So basically, in these positions, uh, white wants to push these queenside pawns. Nowadays, this is the most common thematic idea in this position, but we'll see how Steinitz plays this. He plays rook c1, putting the rook on the open file, and uh, c5. And after takes, takes here, uh, Black takes up a hanging pawn structure, which is very nice here. Okay, very interesting that we see these kind of uh, dynamic pawn structures even uh, back in those days. Okay, so here queen a4 move, having ideas of putting pressure on this knight and also having ideas of swinging the queen over to h4 to coordinate with this bishop on h7 and threaten uh, moves like bishop f6 in the future. Although now it won't be a real threat because you can replace it. So he cuts off the queen switching over with knight e4. And okay, bishop into e4 was played. And after d4, 
we have a rook to d1. The point here is even though the bishop and the knight are both hanging, uh, he's just saying, okay, you take one of my pieces, I will take uh, your piece, and my rook is getting active on the seventh rank. This is actually very, very a valid point. So after bishop into g5, we have knight into g5, queen into g5, and over here, rook takes on d7. And you're already hitting the bishop once, and the bishop really ha doesn't have too many comfortable squares to go to. Bishop c8, uh, okay, you're already weakening a7 and e4. White is just creating too many weaknesses that he's going to exploit in this position. And okay, so here we have a rook f to b8. Uh, instead of just taking uh, either the e4 pawn or anything like that, here he just continues to put more pressure on black. Now he's attacking the b7 bishop twice, but he's also coordinating on f7. So that's a very nice double attack. And you can't save both, really. Uh, if you, like, you can't uh, protect both at the same time. You can't play bishop d5 because that would just hang the piece to the queen. Uh, you will trade queens, but of course you will hang the bishop. Black plays bishop c6 saying that, okay, you can take my pawn. So bishop c6, queen takes f7. King to h8 and rook. I mean, first h4 here. First h4. The point of h4 is very, very uh, clear because you can't take this pawn. Uh, this mate over here is hanging. But also, in a way, it's also creating an escape square for the king, which you will feel, which you will find very, very uh, useful in the later part of this game. So there is no back rank weakness now. So h4 has gotten rid of back rank weakness. Black plays queen g4, which is the only move on this file that uh, still continues the game for him. And rook into a7. So uh, white is now completely having a big, big positional advantage. And he just tries to convert uh, this advantage. A rook into b2, uh, first rook into a7, the trade. And rook into b2 was played. Now white has to defend black's attack after queen c5. White is clear two pawns up. Uh, but okay, black has an attack here. Black plays queen e6 with the idea of protecting his bishop that way because he couldn't really uh, move the bishop uh, because of this ma two mate threats. He can't save both the mate threats. So with this move, he actually defends very creatively. Rook d1 was played, now making another mate threat, uh, but also making another threat, which is uh, not noticeable. He plays h6, getting out of all the back rank mates, but he falls to rook d6, which is winning the piece on the spot. Black plays queen f7, saying, okay, if you take my piece, I am mating in two moves. Okay, white can't take the piece. White plays knight d1. And now counter-attacking the rook. So now rook and bishop both are hanging. So you can't uh, save both. Uh, black tries to make complications with rook e2 with the idea of rook e1. Uh, okay, so if you take the bishop, rook e1 is an interesting move. And black can uh, try to play for complications. But here... White just plays king f1. Fantastic move. And uh, now the rook has nowhere safe to go. He can take on a2 really, but the bishop is hanging. And black has really no counterplay for the piece. You can also take with the queen. It doesn't really matter. After queen takes, there is going to be a very good uh, combination with the queen and rook. If the queen leaves uh, the defense of the king. Uh, for example, if you take this and take this. Already white is threatening. Rook check and queen check followed by mating attack. So, okay, uh, with the piece down, this position was hopeless. And after king f1, black simply resigned the game. And black in this game uh, was Adolf Anderson, a very famous player back in the time. And if you remember the game of the century played by Adolf Anderson, very famous player, very strong player. Willem Stein, it's plays against him in this game and excels. Okay, let's move on. To the next game. In this game, uh, William Steinitz is playing with the black pieces against Henry Edward Bird. As we've seen, even in the previous stream, we saw a couple of games Henry Edward uh, Bird has played. So, okay, let's see what happens in this game. Bird your employees his uh, very own Bird's opening. So we have e5, uh, in and uh, Steinitz plays the forms gambit. Which is one of the most common responses to the birds uh, opening here. And here, if you play, for example, knight c3 or you know b3 or moves that 
do not stop this queen h4 checking idea there is a very common trap just to show the trap uh, we have queen h4 check and after g3 you can take on g3 with either the bishop or the queen it doesn't really matter uh, because after takes takes bishop takes it's just checkmate okay this is one of the uh, uh, very common trap in uh, the from the gambit but okay he knows this and he plays knight f3 guarding the h4 square now there's no more queen h4 check ideas knight f6 was played and d4 after knight c6 we have bishop to g5 and bishop to g4 e3 and queen d7 black is ready to castle we have bishop takes f6 g takes f6 and are damaging the pawn structure on the king side bishop to b5 now castle neglecting that d5 is going to come the point here is even though white played d5 black saw this move queen e7 now he's getting out of the pin and ready to play knight e5 on the next move taking this knight is not very good because of the queen e3 and black is getting a counter attack here but uh white bites white's asking okay what do you have here he takes on c6 with the bishop though but it doesn't matter to white. Right, okay the point here is if you take with the pawn Bishop g3 is just asking, you know, uh, hanging the queen. But okay, he takes with the bishop. This queen takes e3 check. And after queen e2, queen c1 check. And here, after, you know, queen d1, he's not even taking back, you know, the bishop. He just gives up more material. He hangs a rook uh, with rook e1, rook e8 check and takes, takes king f2. Although this queen is safe from capture, the king is actually now on the run. Queen d3 check. Now king f1 and after bishop and f3, very precise move. Bishop f3, g f3 and bishop c5, black is completely winning in this position. Queen f2 is a very difficult threat to stop. If you play something like queen d1 or queen d2, the point is uh, queen into f3 is immediately winning because the king has no escape squares. The queen will be forced to block on f2. We can simply checkmate. King G King G2 was played in the game, uh, but okay. After Rook G8, uh, White simply resigned uh, in view of uh, this move. King here and checkmate. Or if you go back, Queen F2 is checkmate. And really, uh, there is no way uh, for White to con you know go on here. White was completely lost. Uh, you know, even as of this point, there was nothing that White could do after Queen into E3. White is completely losing, and his ideas are very very restricted. Okay, uh, this is a very, again, a very uh, nice peace sacrifice by Willem Steinitz. And let's move on to the seventh game. Willem Steinitz plays against Louis Paulson, another player which who we saw in the previous stream. Let's check out how he plays this game. We have e4, e5, knight c3, and knight c6. Okay, we see the Vienna game move order, uh, but uh, the game after f4 ef4 d4 we see queen h4 and king e2 now this game i included for uh, the bong cloud fans okay so here he takes his king not only to e2 but in a couple of moves you will see he pushes his king all the way to e3 the point here is okay he doesn't want to allow Okay, uh, king e3 is def definitely not a good move, but he's uh, playing king e3 here and still he survives. Uh, black is not winning here. Queen h5 was played and bishop e2. After black tries something with queen a5, he just plays a3, bishop into f3, king into f3. King is almost in the center of the board. Queen h5 check, king back to e3 and queen h4. We have b5, b4, not even worrying about the king's position on e3. We have g5 uh, by black. And of course, black could have exploited this position better. But just to show uh, the sheer, uh, you know, fearlessness of white here. You know, with uh, b5 and knight d7, rook f1. Finally, after knight f6, white decides to retreat his king to g1. And okay, now it becomes the same game again. But as soon as uh, you know you you think that it's going to be sane, 
you know things break loose again so after a4 rook g8 a b3 a b3 and rook in f3 and the point of rook f3 is to allow bishop g4 to be played okay very nice exchange sacrifice very sound one he plays king b8 in the position and knight to d5 getting a temp tempo of the queen and really okay this position is starting to look good for white white breaks open the position with a4 and uh, black tries to counter attack with f5 although uh, b4 would have been a better try here because now after a b3 just hanging the bishop which cannot be taken really because of a b takes on c7 uh, you know winning the exchange but also continuing the attack in very aggressive fashion uh you know black will be completely lost basically if you take this you're not just losing the exchange you're actually losing the game on the spot you see it we have rook a8 check king a7 and you will queen here and this is just losing like you have two queens on the board and okay there's no way white is escaping this it's going to end in mate for sure so of course you can't take the bishop so he had to take the pawn to stop this and we have a knight takes on b6 now if you take the bishop there's another very very dangerous threat of queen c3 now the point is rook a8 is checkmate and this idea is actually unstoppable you have no way to stop this queen c3 very quiet but very strong move so still can't touch the bishop and okay black finds this as well and he finds a creative defense the point is he wants to bring his knight to c6 to blockade this uh, c file so that uh, king can make a getaway square so okay, he takes an f5 and uh, now the point here was of course uh, he wanted to bring his queen to the uh, defense so okay he plays queen to f7 and f6 so f6 uh, was again okay he doesn't want to take this he just wants to bring his knight to the c6 square and organize his defense although here taking this would not be good because you're again uh, you know, unharmonizing your pieces and moves like knight d7 were possible. Trying to get at least the exchange up, and you know, this would have been bad for black. Okay, uh, queen d7 was again played in view of this move f6 and knight d7, which would have won the exchange very easily. Okay, knight c6 and c4. Now that the threat of queen c3 no longer exists, uh, black wants to read out this knight and kind of block the a file with it, and after the move. Queen to a2, he plays knight to b5, trying to, you know, uh, you know, if uh, white takes this extra piece, uh, black is completely fine because white sacked a full rook in the position. And uh, here, okay, he, he's up, okay, he's going to get back, take, uh, white, sorry, white is down a full exchange and uh, he's just going to get back uh, the piece and he's going to be two pieces for the rook, but okay, that is not sufficient. I mean, White thought that was not sufficient and he could get more in the position. So he plays knight d5, threatening queen a8 mate. And this actually wins the game on the spot. Black had to play queen d5. And after cd5, knight takes on d4. Uh, White finds a very simple mate in 3. You can uh, pause your videos and try to work it out. I'm going to go on with it. Uh, the move was queen a7 check. King c7 is the only move. Rook c1 check and regardless of where this knight blocks, it's just mate in one after knight c6 and rook c6 because of this pin, the pawn cannot capture and this is checkmate. Let's move on guys. Okay, so here uh, we move on to game 8. Uh, William Steinis plays Mihail Shigorin in uh, the 92 World Championship. This is a World Championship match game and this is one of uh, his most famous games so the next three games are one you know our uh, collection of william steinis william steinis classics so these are the games that uh, you guys can learn a lot from okay so these are the very very important games which all of you need to know so e4 e5 and these ideas in these games are really really fascinating okay knight c6 and bishop b5 moving to the Roy lopez Okay, we see the Royal Lopez and we see Berlin defense. The Berlin defense was uh, actually uh, started, they started playing it uh, back in that day, but uh, it was not played for a very, very long time uh, in the 20th century. It was not very popular. 
and it was actually popularized by Vladimir Kramnik in the 2000 World Championship match against Garry Kasparov, where he won uh, back the World Championship title and uh, he dethroned Garry Kasparov. So, okay, this is a very, very interesting opening that uh, remains uh, relevant even to this day in the highest level. Okay, so D3, we have D6. D3 and okay, we have G6. Uh, okay, this uh, position has okay become like a modern defense structure. Okay, we have a knight f1, and this maneuver even today is very very popular. Knight d7 and knight comes to e3. Knight comes to c5 and bishop to c2. All of these maneuvers are even to this day okay. Knight on c5 is not uh, very popular today. Today you might see a move like f5 being played. But okay, now this knight wants to go to f4. That is a black's point. We have h4 trying to open the you know king side because white is not yet castled again, similar to the previous game. We have h5 and d5 opening the center and ed5. Oh, sorry, hg6, fg6, and ed5. Knight takes d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d5. We have bishop to b3, pinning the knight, and we play queen e2 here. Okay, already over here, uh, you're putting pressure on e5 pawn. Okay, uh, black plays bishop d7. And now if you take the e5 pawn, actually, it's not so good. Uh, because, okay, here, you're actually opening up the file to your own king before castling. So that would be risky for white. Also, you're hanging g2, which is bad for you. Before castling, that is. Okay, so here, bishop, d bishop e3 was played just to prepare castling. And king h8, unpinning the knight. The castle queen side and rook a to e8 and both sides have brought all their pieces into play and white plays queen f1 getting the queen out of the rook's pile looks rook's x-ray attack okay, so we have a5 because of opposite side castling black starts the pawn strong and white just breaks in the center with d4 trying to open the position here after ed4 Knight d4, knight d4, or uh, bishop d4. Uh, one would expect, uh, you know, a move like bishop d4. But here, we have an exchange sacrifice. And this is popularly known as the double rook sacrifice played by William Steinitz. After rook into h7 here, the game ended very quickly after queen h1 check, king g7, and bishop h6 check. And really, uh, white is uh, black is just getting mated here. It's forced mate after king f6, queen h4 check, and there's nothing to do here. There's nothing left to do. You can't play g5 because queen into g5 is simply mate. Uh, if you play king f4, queen f4 is mate. Uh, in the game, we had king e5, uh, but after queen into d4, black resigned the game because the only move is king f5, and we have queen f4 check mating, and uh, White went on to even win that world championship match. Okay, so William Stein it's won that world championship match. That was one game from the from the complete match. Okay, so here uh, we see the next game against Kurt von Bardleben, and this is also a very very famous game, uh, which is actually a very uh, also very interesting idea in the to finish the game. So it's all it's a very beautiful position to see. Let's see how the game uh, goes. Okay, knight c6, and this time we have an Italian game. E4, d5, Italian game, and we have c3. Nowadays, very popular line in the Italian c3, uh, preparing d4. Okay, knight c6 and d4. We have e d4, c d4, bishop b4 check, knight c3, and this is actually this was actually a very popular line back in the day. You're hanging the e4 pawn, but okay, this is a very complex line. A uh, black plays d5, and white plays e d5, and knight to d5, and castle. Okay, so now even c3 pawn is hanging, but uh, white really uh, is not worried. A uh, black just plays bishop e6, and bishop to g5, hitting the queen. Bishop goes back to e7, and now bishop takes on d5, bishop takes on d5, knight takes on d5. Queen takes on d5 and bishop takes on e7. A whole lot of trades at the end of it.
the king is now stuck in the center of the board because rook to e1, now he cannot castle. Whichever side he castles, the knight hangs. And now queen goes back to, okay, we have f6 first and after queen e2, queen e7, he still cannot castle on both sides of the you know board because now the knight is just going to hang for free and with peace up, you will easily win the game. Rook c1 was played and uh, here we have c6 on the board. And white here finds a very creative idea, d5. A beautiful pawn sacrifice, giving a pawn to vacate the d4 square for the knight. And knight d4 was played in the game. And after king to f7, the knight intrudes on e6. Knight e6 and uh, really causing a lot of problems. Rook hc8 was played. And your queen g4, not only threatening the g7 pawn, but also threatening to discover, check, and attack the queen, which is actually unprotected at this moment. So he, pro he plays g6, protecting the g7 pawn, but we have knight g5 check. King e8, the only move that holds on to the queen, but we see the point of knight g5 check now after rook takes on e7. Now the point is you cannot take either way. The problem with queen takes e7 is you just play rook takes. Rook takes and queen takes and with king takes rook is uh, simply that after rook e1 check you will have to part ways with the queen after king here we have a knight sorry knight e6 check my bad and wherever you move the king here or here the only two legal moves after knight c5 the queen is just hanging and you cannot save the queen you can go king e3 as well uh, but okay, uh, this is also not so um, uh, very good for you because here we have queen c5 check and uh, a very dangerous position where white is getting, I mean, black is getting mated very, very quickly. We'll not get into this. You guys can work this out uh, for king d6 if you can find. After uh, rook e7 in the game, we get king f8. And now you will see a very beautiful pattern. You will just play king, rook f7. Now uh, you can see that, okay, right away the queen cannot take again because of rook c8. And a similar tactic, but in the end of this tactic, the queen will also be under attack. So, okay, uh, he has to block with the queen. And we get similar positions, but a little improved version for white because he gets to grab both the pawns. Okay, he moves the king again. This time he just continues to follow the king with rook g7 check. The point is okay now if you try going back in this position, already you're losing after a rook e1 check. Why can't he take the hanging queen here? Because uh, he takes the rook and it's mate. Okay, so if you can't take the queen with check, you're not going to win the game. So if you play here, a uh, rook e1 check, uh, after this, you're getting mated. Okay, so you can't go back. Now, again, similar idea. If you take rook on c8 is hanging, king h8, and now rook h7. And okay, still similar ideas. Okay, so king h8, this position black resign, but after let's just show a continuation king h8, uh, king g8 here, and okay, uh, rook g7 will be played. And now the point is if you go back, you have queen h4 check, which is winning on the spot. Okay, so for example, here queen h4 check, you have to take the rook and uh, queen check, and this is the move. Check. And okay, I believe we cannot take the queen here because uh, we're getting mated, but after check, uh, we have this rook entering the attack. And this is going to end very badly for black. Okay, so yeah, queen f6 check. And okay, black is, get, black is getting into all sorts of trouble here. And eventually, white should coordinate very well to gain a very interesting attack here. But okay, in the game, we didn't uh, see this variation. But this is, I believe, is completely winning. Uh, okay. If you go back here, uh, knight h7 check is again winning on the spot. 
Now the queen can be taken with a check. This is the difference. If you take this, uh, and if you do not take this and go here, and anyway, it's getting taken with check. Actually, this is checkmate. So this is a winning uh, position for white. So yeah, we see this and uh, very, very uh, nice idea by uh, white here and really beautiful pattern in the end of just following the king. Not every day you see such beautiful uh, stuff. Let's see the 10th game of today's analysis and this is the shortest game of today. In this game, okay, we see the French defense being played, uh, you know, uh, employed by Bird. D4, D6, D4, D5, and over here, Knight C3, the classical variation. And he goes for the Rubinstein. So, Bird chooses to play D takes E4, Knight takes E4, and Knight F6. Knight takes F6, and Queen takes F6. Today, uh, okay, this is a well known variation. And okay, Knight C6, not a very good move. Uh, we want to play H6 because. We want to stop bishop g5 kind of ideas, but okay, bishop g5 comes on the board and queen to f5 was played. Bishop to d3 and here black made a big mistake of queen g4 and uh, right now the queen trap is inevitable. After h3 the queen is basically trapped. So here at this point you might want to play a move like queen d5 or queen a5. Black should be okay at the very least but uh, white gains an advantage because of all the tempi he's gaining by developing his pieces for free here. Now, while black wants to develop, he cannot because his queen is getting attacked every move. But after queen g4, the queen is simply lost. You cannot save the queen after h3. In the game, we had queen g2. Uh, but if you go queen h5, uh, this g4 is trapping the queen. And you don't have any other safe moves with the queen. You have to take on g2. And after rook h2, the queen is officially out of moves and queen took on h2 in the game knight takes on h2 and okay black took on d4 and the game quickly ended after this beautiful tactic bishop b5 check now this knight is just a free piece he's just going to take it the knight cannot take the bishop uh, because of queen d8 checkmate and okay uh, if you play c6 uh, thinking okay we take the bishop uh, after you take the knight you really can't really take the bishop back because uh, mid threat is just hanging and if you try something like bishop d7 saying okay now this time if you take and we take we are defending the d8 square so it's okay but uh, this time we take on d7 first with a check anyway we're winning a piece so really this knight is just gone so knight in a d4 was a decisive mistake but okay at least I, I, anyway the game was lost after queen g4 uh, but after bishop b5 black resigned the game and a beautiful miniature in the French uh, by William Steinitz. And okay, I was uh, in the first, uh, when I was looking for a collection of games, I was choosing and trying to choose 10 games, but I added the 11th one as a bonus. In the 11th game, William Steinitz actually plays with rook odds. A very, very interesting game. And uh, just like the first game here, he again employs famous. Evans Gambit. Bishop takes b4, c3, and bishop to a5, and d4. e takes d4, castles. Knight f6, and we have bishop a3, not allowing the black king to castle. We have bishop to g b6, and queen to b3, and at this point, we have d5, e d5, and knight a5 here we have rook e1 check bishop e6 uh saying okay now you can't take my bishop uh, because your queen is hanging but white says okay that's exactly what i'm going to do queen is hanging black jumps to take the queen but now we see a beautiful sequence of moves that ends in forced checkmate king c6 knight d5 check king b5 bishop b4 check king to a5 bishop to b4 check king to a4 and king after finishing his beautiful walk calls the spawn checkmate of a takes b3 and uh, that was actually a very very stunning and really uh, that was 
you know fascinating i hope you guys enjoyed uh please do follow uh the channel and i will just drop the link in the chat okay so you can uh, follow me on instagram we'll uh, see you guys in the next stream until then bye bye